Hi, everybody. Once again, uh, Hobby Memorial Library and CTC has another virtual event, and we're very excited. Today, we have our resident CTC astronomer, Warren Hart, that will be um, giving us some great information on stargazing without a telescope um, and the spring equinox, and he's got a lot of fun information. He is very interactive, and so he wants to ask us questions. So when he asks a question, you can go ahead and put it in the comments, and Lee will go ahead and uh, translate that. Not translate it, but we'll give it over to Warren. Also, if you have questions throughout the event, um, Warren just wants you to go ahead and um, ask your questions away, and Lee will go ahead and ask them for you. Um, as in all of our virtual events, if you had a professor ask you to watch this for extra credit, make sure that you go to the library's website, look for the events, click on um, the registration and register. Or if you want to go ahead and have attendance credit for the library scholarship, make sure you register for the event. So I am going to turn it over to Warren and he's going to go ahead and take it away from here. Okay, Warren. All right. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, what I intend to give you uh, an overview of what the different events are going to be happening for this this month of March. Now, we've already gone through three days and we're now on the fourth day. So uh, what I have uh, is I have a calendar that we can put up and we'll be able to see the different events and when they occur, and I'll talk about them. And as uh, Ms. Oser mentioned, at any time, if you have a question or you have a comment, or, or if you agree or disagree, either way, doesn't matter. Uh, go ahead and voice it or text it or what, and then uh, through the magic of electricity, I will get the question here and we can deal with it. I do not uh, want anyone to wait until I'm through talking because by then, we're not in the context of uh, what you were asking, or you might have forgotten, or whatever. Anyway, so let's bring up our first slide, not the blank one, of course, but the one with the calendar on it. Now, you uh, can see here, uh, this is the calendar, a very simple one. I uh, did not put on there all the other things that are happening, of course, in the sky. But uh, this is what we have. Today is Thursday. It is the 4th of March. So in spite of something happened Monday, uh, we'll get back to it. But I want to start right here with the Thursday event. So uh, let's go to the next slide and we'll highlight that or, uh, there. Uh, this is just a paragraph up there talking about when I put on here and you're gonna see there are seven specific constellations that I'm gonna talk about for this month. And whatever date that they are listed, that is the beginning of their best uh, night for the viewing. And so, for instance, as we look, here is Thursday, and you see that there are two constellations that are mentioned. First is Leo Minor. That's the uh, the lion cub, and I forget the, na the name of the cub in the movie, uh, but somebody will remember that. And then the other one is Hydra, and that's the female water snake. 
And uh, so that's what we'll start talking about. So let's go to the next slide. There they are, go ahead to the next one. And it's going to indicate we're going to talk about Leo Minor. So let's go to that next slide now. Each constellation, by the way, if anyone in the group plays the piano and you know how many keys there are on a standard piano, if you want to call that number in, it will have a significance as far as that number with uh, the, what we're talking about here. This is a Leo Minor. Now, each constellation page that I've put together, like this one, has uh, two sides to it. Every constellation has two pages. Some may have three and even four. And there's a lot of things depending on. The white or the lighter area that's in the middle of the page is the designated, if you will, area in the sky that the professional astronomers talked about and agreed upon back in uh, 1930. Uh, up until that time, a, uh, the constellations, there were, how big were they? How small were they? When did they end or what? It was all subjective. So it would depend on which astronomer you talked to was, well, how big is Leo Minor? Oh, we got an answer there. 88 keys on a piano keyboard. That is correct. So as a memory device, a mnemonic device, there are 88 constellations in the entire sky. So that'll help you and say, well, how many are there? Very good. So anyway, uh, the astronomers got together and in a sense, they surveyed and laid out the boundaries for each of the constellations. And that's what this white area is. Also, what I do is I number different stars and different things that is in that area on the, in the sky. To give you an idea of what it is you would be looking at, think if you were at home or if you're at school or wherever, and you look out a window, a relatively, we'll say a smaller window, not a whole wall window. So how, how far can you see? Well, as far as you're able to uh, view anything. So you are looking through a depth of what's in that area of that window that you can look through. And that's the same thing when we are trying to visualize here these uh, areas in the sky. And so think of it that this is a window pane that we would look through for anything that comes into that window pane for Leo Minor, and we would label it something that's relative to Leo Minor. So that's the way we try to bring it from a two dimension to a three dimension uh, object there. It's a long, long, long tube. And depending on what is out there, uh, something may be that in, in that area, that's 13 to 15 billion light years away from us. Anyway, uh, here are the numbers. On the second page, which I don't have for Leo Minor, I didn't put it up uh, here, uh, is information that talks about what all these numbers, the names of these stars, uh, different pieces of information about each one of them, 
anything else that there might be and I put it on there and so that if you decide you want to print out these constellations, uh, they're on uh, standard uh, eight and a half, 11 paper, and you can print it front and back. So if you take your the paper out with you for your night viewing, then you would have this for a reference and you could turn the page over and uh, you've identified a star and you can get a little bit of information about it. But, uh, what I also wanted to say is we have that Leo Minor, let's go to the next slide. And we have Hydra. Now, before we go, I want to emphasize, uh, emphasize here and up in that paragraph, and you can have the opportunity to read that as we go along. The date for Leo Minor and Hydra on the 4th of uh, March, Thursday, your viewing would start this evening uh, after or at or after sunset. And then as time goes on through the night, both Leo Minor and Hydra would be rising in the sky. <clears throat> and the date that I picked for this is so that at your midnight, the true midnight, <clears throat> not on your watch, but the true midnight halfway between sunset and sunrise of Friday morning, that both of these constellations, their main part, their center part, would be the highest that they would rise up in the southern sky. And that's why I picked these dates here. So they start on the evening of the day that's listed, goes through the night, and of course at midnight we change to the next day. And so it's from sunset Thursday to sunrise Friday morning. Let's take a look at Hydra. That's the next slide. Hydra, <clears throat> as you can see up at the top up there, I also just put a little, little thing that it is the 71st of the 88 constellations of, of being the brightest. So it's not real bright, but Notice in red, it is the largest of all of the constellations. Now, if you are keen eyed here, you're going to read that and you say, no, wait a minute, Warren. You said there's 88 constellations, but you're talking about 89 different separate areas, spherical areas in the sky. Yes, that's true because there is one constellation that is split up into two separate sections. And so there are only 88 constellations in the sky, but there are 89 different, if you want to call them segments in the sky. And that's why I said the 89 spherical areas in the sky. Now, if you are planning to watch Hydra, you notice you're going to be out there a long time because it starts and it just keeps going and going and going. Another thing about Hydra and uh, what I have on the second page of each one of them, uh, it's a listing of the constellations that border that uh, the uh, specific constellation. Hydra is unique because it is the largest constellation, so thereby, thereby it has the most number of constellations that's on that's on its border. Thirteen. And so there would be, if you started counting and around there, you would see eventually uh, there will be 13 different constellations. 
And uh, also you notice in the right hand section of uh, the constellation, there is a yellow circle with a, a crosshair on it. And that is significant. That is talking about uh, a cluster of stars. And so that would be on the second page of Hydra, which I did not put here today uh, on here to save time. Now, this is also uh, what we would use in uh, when we go outside for a, we would call a star party or a night sky tour or whatever, would try to let everybody uh, get a copy of each of the constellations, and then we'd go out and look up in the sky and identify one of the constellations and what can you tell about it and get some information so that uh, the main thing I go by is my email is the Naked Eye Astronomer uh, without uh, using a telescope or binoculars. I just like to have people come out and we'll just look up in the sky. I'll use my laser. It's a very, it's a powerful laser so I can point things out. And I want them, to, want everybody to begin learning a portions of the sky so that you do not, I do not want you to feel intimidated by it. Just start like I did, and everybody who's ever done this, you start with at least one constellation, and then you keep going from there on. And that's what I would encourage you to do. So tonight, uh, if you can uh, go ahead and print these out and be ready and go out and see if you can find both Leo Minor and also a part of uh, Hydra as she uh, slithers across the sky. Let's go to the next slide, if you would, please. Now, you notice here, uh, this is now we're going to talk about the moon. And <clears throat> a, we, we call these phases of the moon, which is not really technically correct because what we're talking about is the a beginning uh, segment of the uh, the moon uh, what is happening to it what we can say is at 7 30 tomorrow evening then the third or the last quarter of the moon will be visible or you would see the moon and that's what you would see you would see it it look uh, uh the moon would look like it's one half is uh illuminated and the other half is dark relatively dark now uh notice this is uh, the time is at 7 30 p.m but uh, you're not going to see it at that time because it's going to be below the horizon. A last quarter moon you will only see in the morning. So when you get up in the morning and you're walking out to go uh, get the paper or go to school, go to work or whatever, if you see in the morning the moon, it is what we call another term of, about it. It is a waning moon, W-A-N-I-N-G. So what does a waning moon, what does that word mean? It's an old English term and we use it quite often. Uh, let's see if someone can come up with that. So let's take a look. Let's go to the next slide while we're dealing with this. Okay. Now, uh, and the next slide. 
you'll see up at the top the phases of the moon and i'm saying that we are looking uh, down on earth we're looking down on santa claus's home all right it'd be right there in the very top middle of earth the moon orbits the earth as we would look would you say that's a clockwise or counterclockwise direction that the moon is orbiting? And what did the virtual librarian say? I didn't read that. Was that? Oh, getting smaller. Uh, that is correct. Waning means it is getting smaller uh one of the terms one of the ways to use it you are losing strength uh used in uh, a sentence um so and so his or her health is waning that's what we talk about and what is is happening is less and less of the illuminated part of the moon can we see so it looks like it's just getting darker and darker and darker and that's correct so from at the top of there let's go to the next slide we would see here the third quarter moon and if we are on earth they're on the top of the of uh, earth and looking out at the moon we would see the left side is illuminated from the sun and the right side is not illuminated so it would be in the dark and as time goes on then it will wane down as we continue for the next part so from third quarter to the next one is a phase uh you can call it you're still in a third quarter but we would call it a waning crescent moon if you wanted to put the whole thing together all right let's go on to the next slide please uh here is a constellation another one our third one there are a total of seven chameleon uh the chameleon there and uh it's a small constellation and uh, let's just take a look at its picture the next one okay here we go it is very very far to the south as you can tell when you look down toward the bottom of the page and there is the south pole the southern pole and you see the area for chameleon is almost at the south pole uh, it's not because uh, in a couple months we'll be talking about octans which actually is at the south pole well <clears throat> how far how many angles from one direction of the horizon to the opposite direction of the horizon how many degrees of sky can you see? Can you see all 360 degrees of the sky? Or can you only see a portion of it? So if you can tell us how much from one horizon and to the opposite side of the other, where the other part of that horizon would go down, how much can we see? and that will then have a factor very good 180 degrees that's correct we can see a total of 180 degrees so that means in figuring out how much of the sky can we see we can only see 180 degrees of the total sky at any one time and if we're looking toward the south we will have at our southern horizon which would be down toward the bottom here 
we can only see down so far of the rest of the sky and there's a portion that if you stay here at the planetarium and Colleen area and all right here, you will never see that part of the sky unless you travel and go south, then you can. Look up at the top on the chart. You see something there, uh, a brown uh, there. It says CTC Planetarium's Southern Horizon. And I put that and I have a dashed line. And so everything from that dashed line down to the South Pole, we cannot see any of that in the sky. Now, some of you may recognize, and the name is not on it, so I'll leave that, it's a good thing. Over where it says on the left, the upper left, CTC planetariums, that is an area of a constellation. Look at it and see if you can think of what the name of that constellation might be. Anyway, uh, again, so down here for chameleon, I would indicate on the, on the, the second page that it is not visible. We will never see it unless we travel down to the south. Okay. Now let's go ahead to our next one. And we go down to next week and uh, we're going to have two additional con uh, constellations similar as what we did with Leo Minor and Hydra. And so let's start with and go to the next slide. We're going to start with Ursa Major, uh, the big bear. Now let's go ahead and let's look at that, that slide. There it is. And uh, you can also tell if you look on the side of the diagram, you see at the bottom, uh, almost the bottom left corner of it, it says plus 20 degrees, and then up plus 30, plus 40, plus 50. And then the other two are not listed there, 60 and 70 and all. Uh, the North Pole would be up in the top of the paper what we have, uh, what we're looking at. And so this also gives you an idea of what we're, uh, what's there. Again, here's the numbers of uh, the constellation and all of that information would be on the second page of the constellation page. You should be able to recognize in the diagram the connecting the green lights uh, lines that there may be an object you might be familiar with. And if there is, why don't you tell me what to uh, tell us all what that object is and what do you call it? Okay. Now, Let's see, uh, the Big Dipper, very good. I have, uh, in the sky, I have four dippers. I have the Teeny Dipper, the Little Dipper, the Big Dipper, and the Giant Dipper. So if you were ever to come and sit in on uh, my night sky tours throughout the year, you will find and be able to identify all four of those dippers. Now, <clears throat> what we can do here real quick, if you look at what we see there, the big dipper uh, on that, actually, when you call it that part of this of uh, Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, there's a technical term for that, and it's called an asterism. That's A-S-T-E-R, 
ISM. And the, what that means is, it is uh, the name of an object in the sky that is not the name of any of the 88 constellations in the sky. So there is no Big Dipper constellation in the sky. It's a part here of Ursa Major. There's some others that will come up in the summer. There's another uh, asterism that is uses three uh, constellations together to describe and show it. It's very large, but that's technically that's called an asterism. Looking here at the Dipper, then, uh, if you look at the pan. And I want you to look at the two stars that are on the side of the pan that's on the side opposite the handle. You should see those, to those two right there. Now, we are going to use them to help you to find the, con the constellation and also the star Polaris. There's one thing we cannot do. You cannot do when you look in the sky, just by, a, you know, especially with your naked eye, not even with binoculars, nor with even a telescope. You cannot do that. There's a process that you have to work out. We cannot measure distance. A, because when we look up in the sky, our brain, our mind in, uh, leads us to visualize everything in the sky as uh, like inside the planetarium on a dome. But that's not correct. Remember, we're looking through a long tube into thousands, millions, and billions of light years away. But we see it, and all we can perceive is that must be two dimensions up there, but it's actually three. But we can do one other thing. We can always measure angles. So if you would hold uh, either uh, hand out in front of you at arm's length, your predominant hand that you use at arm's length, your little pinky, if you stick it up, at arm's length will give you an angle of looking in the sky of about one degree. Now, if you take and with your, hold your thumb up, uh, you are about two degrees across your thumb. Now take your thumb and your little pinky, put them together and then hold up the middle three fingers all together and that's about five degrees across. Now make a fist at arm's length, and you can hold it horizontally or vertically, doesn't matter. And that's going to be, depending on you, maybe eight to 10 degrees across. Now let's take and make a hook them horns, spread them out, and you can get up 12, 14 degrees from the tip of your index finger, where way over to the tip of your little pinky. And then lastly, if you take and stretch it completely out from the tip of your thumb to the tip of the little finger, you may get 18 and some could get up, up to 20 degrees across. So you can use your hands to measure angles. So you say, okay, Warren, big deal. All right. Notice those two stars on the opposite side from the handle of the pot. 
they look like they're in a straight line, pretty straight. But if you took and you can identify that constellation, Ursa Major, you see the Big Dipper up there, and you lay across those two stars, you could probably, and I can, I can put my middle three fingers right there in between them, and it fits perfectly. So that's about five degrees. Now, I want to go in the direction that they are pointing. And I want to point out the top of the pan. And we should be able to figure that out. The top of the pan would be above it. So I'm going to take my middle three fingers, go move them around, and on the top of those two, the lip of uh, there we call the lip star and I put my middle three fingers and I'm holding them horizontally. I'm going to move those middle three fingers five and a half times and I will work my way up and if you look up at the top you notice it says there that's the 11th hour of uh, astronomical longitude. But if you work your way up five and a half times to, in a straight line, you're going to wind up right at Polaris. And you do that by measuring, and you're able to get there. OK? Now, let's go on to the next slide. And there's Leo the lion. Let's go on, and let's take a look at Leo. Here he is, and uh, I've been talking about uh, different things about the constellation in, on the calendar. Some of you may have picked that up, others might not have noticed. So back up a slide if you would, please, Cynthia. Notice I say Leo the lion is ecliptical and equatorial. Notice up that on the Thursday uh, night, Hydra is equatorial. And look over to the right, and on Saturday the 6th, Chameleon is not mentioned that way. Now let's go, back, uh, go on forward again, and let's go and see if we can figure out why I call it that. There's the white area of Leo the lion. If I say it is an equatorial constellation, what word comes to your mind? There you go, equator. Look at the look at the this uh, the drawing here. Look down at the bottom of his feet, and there's a brown line across, and it's labeled equator. And if you notice. Part of the area designated for Leo the lion goes into the southern hemisphere. So Leo the lion constellation straddles the equator. The other term I used was ecliptical. And if you notice, there's a diagonal light blue line labeled ecliptic. And what that is there, uh, there what word also comes to mind if I say ecliptic? Eclipse, very good, eclipse. So this is the path, the ecliptical is the path of the sun through the sky throughout the year. And also in the same relative plane along that path, the moon and the planets also travel along there too. So you don't look down to the South Pole to find the sun or the moon or those the planets. You're going to see them along that line. The line, ecliptical line, is the sun for the sun and the ecliptic band, which would be wider, would be for the moon and for the planets. 
And so Leo the lion is both an equatorial and an ecliptical constellation. Little tidbit that's on the other page, look up there and uh, up above the, the end of his tail, you see a red arrow, a little bitty dot and something called Icarus. Who knows their Greek mythology? Hmm. Well, Icarus happens to be, let's see, he chose to fly close to the sun. Did he make it? No, he got too close and the wax on his feathers melted and so the feathers fell off and he fell to the sky, uh, back to the ground. Anyway, Icarus, is the farthest identified star we have ever been able to identify and pick out. You get a further in, you start going millions and billions of light years away, you see them, but you just can't break them out because they're so far away and the technology has not improved that much. It's still improving, but it has not improved where we can do it. But we did, because of a specific thing that, it ha that happened, we were able to specifically identify that star. And so it was decided we were gonna call that Icarus. Now, when you go out to look at Leo, do not expect to see Icarus. Uh, not even Hubble uh, would be able to see it. Uh, uh, we have to really work hard. There was a special thing that happened that we could. Let's go on in the next slide. Here is a second page. There you can back up, there you go. That's a typical second page. And uh, there's all the different stars that are numbered. And then there's, the, as you see, as I scroll, you would scroll down and look, there's the asterisms that are related to Leo the lion. There's the names of the bordering constellations. There's interesting information. And also it tells you, if you want to see all of Leo the lion, you must be on earth at or between those two latitudes. Otherwise, you will either see a part of it or not even see it at all. Now, you can use this second page on any of the constellations. Let's say you like Leo the lion. Notice that you turn it over and there's the bordering constellations. Well, you can take all one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight constellations, get some information about them, and you can begin to, let's back up one more slide. Begin, as you notice, there's those constellations, learn what is next to Leo the lion, and so you are learning more of the sky. There we go. All right, let's click forward two times and the next one. Now we're we gonna have a new moon. Let's go ahead. We'll speed it up here a little bit. We went from a third quarter moon up there. Now we're at a new moon. Notice also I have in there, this is where you have the possibility that in this arrangement, when the moon is in between the sun and Earth, we could have an eclipse. Now, which eclipse is it? Is it of the, an eclipse of the sun or is it an eclipse of the moon? Which is it? Very good, solar. Now, how, how many times does the moon go around the Earth in one year? Okay, on average, it is 12. Sometimes we can make it to a 13 there. 
So my question is, do we then get 12 or 13 solar eclipses every year? Yes or no? I'm talking worldwide. And the answer is no. Well, wait a minute, Warren. They're all, all three are in line. Yes, they are. But there's a third dimension we got to look at. So let's look at the next slide. Here's the problem. The orbit of the moon is inclined in relation to Earth. So it goes up and it comes around and it goes down below. So it may be in line with the sun, but the moon is above. And so its shadow does not touch Earth. No solar eclipse. Next slide. Or it may be below. Same thing. What we have to have is, next slide, all three directly in line and on the same plane. And then the shadow of the moon touches Earth, and that part of Earth gets a solar eclipse. Now, I want all of you to stay healthy because on Monday, April the 8th, 2024, in three years from now, we will experience here, right here, as they say, we're going to experience a total solar eclipse of a little over four and a half minutes. The maximum you can have is seven minutes plus. So we're doing pretty good. Now, uh, we're going to, it's going to happen. And this is the first time we're going to have a total solar eclipse that crosses right here in over 500 years. So I want you to pray that on Monday, April the 8th, 2024, let's have clear skies because there is no do-over, okay? You either get it or you don't. So plan ahead. Okay, let's go on. Now I'll speed it up. Okay, here we go on the second Sunday of March. We have our spring forward. You notice I wrote down there, we're gonna spring forward one hour and it's called most people call it daylight saving time, but actually it's technically, it's an energy saving time. And another thing, um, if you have, if you vote or you, your parents vote or whichever, uh, have them uh, to contact your representative and Senator for the state of Texas, they're in session now. And in November, they have promised years in the past, but they haven't done it, but uh, they have promised that they would bring up a ballot, a resolution or whatever, that the people in Texas on the ballot could indicate, do you want to continue daylight saving time, standard time, or do you want to stop it and stay on one and leave it alone? I want to stop it and I want to leave it alone. I want to stay with standard time, but everybody has their own opinion. So anyway, and let's look at the drawing. Next page, next slide. There you go. Pull it down, two o'clock in the morning. One year I did, I just wanted to watch on my cell phone, I watched it and it came up at right at two o'clock, clink, it clicked right to three. How about that? All right, let's go on. Now we have, what is an apogee moon? Almost sounds like an apple or something. I don't know, let's go on. Apogee moon, next slide. I mentioned that the moon orbits the Earth. However, it is a circle, but it's not a constant radius circle. 
it is what we call an ellipse. So there is a time when, apogee, when the moon is the farthest from Earth in that one orbit time period. And when it is farthest from the Earth at that time period, would you think that the visual moon, if you looked at it there, would it look larger or smaller than normal? It's going to be smaller. Sure. Very good. It's it's farther away from us. And in fact, we could have a solar eclipse with an apogee moon. That's all, everything is in perfect alignment. However, it is so far away that it does not cover up the entire sun. So it's centered on the sun and we get what we call an annular eclipse. So it looks like a, a giant uh, uh, fire-like ring around the moon. So that's an annular. Okay, let's go on. Now we also have coming up is our vernal equinox. Vernal is green as uh, uh, for the springtime. And for our northern hemisphere, that's when we start spring. And for the southern hemisphere, they would start a different season. Hmm. Somebody, somebody might know what season they would start. Yes, it is. It's autumn. So they would have their autumnal uh, equinox. Now, when we say equinox, what word comes to mind? Equal day, equal night. And you're correct. The equin equinox is made up of a combination of two Latin words, equilius, which means equal, and nox is night, equal, night. And so let's, let's look at the, di the picture. Next slide. And go ahead. Here we go. The sun is uh, directly overhead at the equator. So at the both North Pole and the South Pole, uh, the North Pole is then as, uh, if you will, it's getting, it's starting its uh, nighttime and the South Pole is starting its illuminated, uh, total illumination, it's summertime uh, there. How many sunrises and sunsets in one year are there at either pole? How many at the North Pole? How many at the South Pole? Let's go on. Next slide. And here's another constellation. Quickly, we'll go on through. Here's Crater of the Cup. Go ahead to it. There it is. It's a small one uh, there. And if you notice the base of the cup to the uh, lower left, or pardon me, lower right of it, uh, there is Hydra. And it rests Crater and Corvus the Crow, which is there to the left, uh, both rest on the back of Hydra, the uh, female water snake. Let's go on to the next slide. Now we're going to have a first quarter moon, and let's see what a first quarter moon is. Go ahead to the next slide. When we went from the new moon, let's see, what do you say? The poles will have, it faded out, will have how many? get that back up there. Anyway, from new moon, as it goes toward the first quarter, we have a waxing crescent. Very good. One day of sun and one day of night. I don't know. That's correct. 
there they have six months of daylight and six months of darkness so if somebody was going to come to your house at, at the north pole and said you wanted to take your daughter out on a date uh don't let them stay overnight because that's six months okay so we have from the new moon and we come around to the first quarter we would have a waxing crescent moon there's your kind of phase your phase until we come up and then we have the first quarter and that's a precise time and point in space next slide now i do the last saturday of the month at 5 p.m for about an hour hour and a half i talk about the next month's activities and the constellations you're welcome to come i don't know how much it costs i'd never deal with that so i would would not have any idea and uh, i during that time i mention a lot more information that we don't have time for right now so uh, next slide in april i'll be talking about these constellations here canis venatici the hunting dog centaurus it's far enough south we can only see a partial view the top 29 degrees of it and then coma berenices uh she was the daughter of uh the pharaoh of egypt i believe it was a pharaoh uh corvus the crow i mentioned crux the cross musca the fly and virgo the maiden of the virgin okay go ahead we're coming to last we're going to have the full moon let's go and let's see it full moon we come around now we have our lineup again sun earth moon and we would have what kind of eclipse could we have now lunar right same thing will we have 12 or 13 lunar eclipses throughout the year uh, next slide no you're correct because again we have so the moon is now above the earth's shadow and the next slide or could be below the, sh the earth's shadow we have to have it directly in line the next slide and then we would have a lunar eclipse because the earth's shadow would be contacting touching the surface of the moon all right go ahead next slide finally we have a perigee moon now what's perigee well notice we had an apogee now we gotta go ahead that's fine the next one we have a perigee and it's closer to earth the way i remember it or i started out learning all these things i just put in my mind oh my goodness the moon is perilously close to earth and so para g is talking about that and that's how i'm able to distinguish between perigee apogee okay next slide now we skipped the first monday but we'll look at it real quick right now so go ahead let's look at next slide there's sextons the sextant this is it here this is our seventh constellation notice it straddles the equator so it's an equatorial it does not touch the ecliptic so it's not an ecliptical constellation next slide and then we have a pair we had a perigee moon monday and next slide we can have in a 31 day month we may have some uh some events happening twice you ever heard of a blue moon okay it's usually a full moon that they're talking about 
but you we would have a blue moon a blue perigee moon this month if you want to call it that so it's two two events same events in one month all right, that ought to take care of it. We're at one o'clock here. I appreciate the time. Does anybody have a question before we say solid ecot? Well, there are none on Facebook at the moment. Okay, well, Warren, I, I just want to let you know that um, we're able to put uh, your different maps onto Facebook that they can see the front and the back. So okay. we're going to put that in the comments. Very good. Very good. And uh, also, if a person decides they want to come to the Saturday evening, last Saturday over there with me, uh, in one year, we will go through the entire sky. And then you can print out those pages. And eventually, you'll have all 88 constellations. And you'll have a map of the sky and you'll become more and more familiar with it. Do not let the sky intimidate you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Warren. And I also want to thank um, uh, Margaret Handro and Ash Garcia, two of my um, co librarians. When we practice this, Warren was asking me questions I couldn't answer. So, so I phoned in a friend. I phoned in two friends to get in here and help answer the questions. So thank you, Ash, and thank you, Margaret, for doing this. Um, thank you, Lee, for uh, streaming again. And definitely go to, we can put the um, uh, Mayborn Science Center uh, website in the, the comments as well so that you guys can follow what Warren's doing. He has a lot going on um, online uh, right now. They don't have into person, but they do also when they'll get some of the repairs done, they'll be back to doing some in person. So right. Warren, did you want to end up with anything? I just wanted to let people know that uh, with the freeze, they're in the building uh, pipe burst and it was not attended for over a period of time. And so the floors uh, was flooded and just keep watching when we can finally say it's clear that we can get back in and start doing the shows. I could not do the last one because uh, it's closed up. We'll see if they get everything fixed up that I can do the one I have here in March for April, may or may not, don't know. Well, we have, um, Warren talked about the Eclipse 2024, and next month we have Warren coming back, and he loves this subject <laughs> about our Eclipse. And yeah. so we will get to have another virtual event with Warren on our Eclipse. And so that will be very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. Also, next week, Make sure you put it on your calendar. We have our very first virtual live poetry slam. It'll be a mixture of live poets, uh, poets that have sent in pre recorded videos, and poets that have sent in pre recorded audios. And there's going to be judging, and we're going to have winners. So make sure on March 9th that you watch that. You know, also, when we do next month, uh, just the thing I will mention when we're in uh, on our uh, streaming here, how you can make money on that day of that eclipse. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> and depending, you can make some fabulous amount of money. And I'll tell you about a person who did on a previous eclipse make a lot of money. We definitely need to take you up on that one. So make sure you don't miss Eclipse 2024, which will be one of our next month's virtual events. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. If you have any further questions 
or comments, make sure you put them in our comments and um, we'll see if, you know, we can answer them. If Warren can answer them, we, um, we have this amazing astronomer at CTC and um, he's there to answer all your questions. So everyone have a great rest of your day. Again, thank you my fellow librarians for rescuing me <laughs> and answering questions because <laughs> I wasn't about to answer them all. We actually had a late minute question. Um, would you like to answer it still? I know we're a little over time, but. What is it? It says, do astronomers use an apogee eclipse to study events on the sun? Uh, they can. It will. It helps some. It does not cut enough out like a, a real total solar eclipse would do, because then you'll see the corona. Uh, and but you can still get uh, some information uh, with with the um, apogee moon uh, there eventually. Of course, not in our lifetime. The moon is slowly moving away from Earth. And so in the far, 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 far distant future, uh, it will the total solar eclipses will never occur again. They will always be annulars. But don't worry about it. It's not for a few million years. Warren, I do have one other question. Do you do sure. your night skies in Belton? Is that where you gather? Is, is that a, a in person thing that y'all do? Do no, what now? Okay, at one point you had told me you told me that you gather in Belton or um, at uh, the point. Oh and yeah, you, Morgan's Point. There's yes. a park park there. And uh, there is already, there's a group uh, that, if I remember right, Girl Scout group, there are one, it's a public event and we can publicize that. It's free, of course. And uh, we'll, all we have to do is pray for no clouds. And uh, I always, when they want to do it, I'll, I'll pick a date when we're not going to have a full moon at night. Okay. All right. And so y'all y'all gather and look at the yeah. stars. Right. Awesome. And you bring bring blankets, chairs, whatever. And then I get up there and I blabber for about an hour or two. It's not blabbering. You you've got so much information. I uh, seriously, it took three librarians to answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right. Well, thank you so much again. Um, thank you guys for coming and um, you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Don't forget to watch us next week with the Poetry Slam. So Warren, don't go anywhere and Lee will take us out.